Okay. So she gave me that horrible big build up and put the bar up here and there's so much pressure and expectation and I'm feeling like just running away and hiding in the corner. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm a one-legged existentialist stand-up beat poet and um, the one-legged part is the pit that people kind of go, mm -hmm. so would you like to see my one leg? My sort of after the official leg, would you like to see it? Yeah. I think I need a bit more enthusiasm. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very vulnerable. Show us your leg. Show us your leg. <laughs> That's why I was waiting for a bit of West Country honesty. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Oh, sorry, wrong one. <laughs> Yay! Woo here we go. Um, so um, I lost my leg in an accident um, uh, about six years ago, and um, I'll uh, tell the story of that a bit later. But what I wanted to do, I wanted to start with the poem, which was about uh, coming to terms with losing one's leg and becoming a disabled person after spending all of your life, uh, 41 years in my case, as an able-bodied person, and then next thing you know, oh my god, I'm the disabled guy. So I wrote a poem called Disabled Guy, and um, it was quite an interesting experience leaving the hospital after the amputation. Um, I was very sort of conscious of the fact that I didn't want to become self-conscious about having one leg. Um, so I wanted to really be able to deal with people's reactions. Uh, because in my universe, we're never going to be able to control human beings' reactions to the unusual or the unknown or something that people are curious or maybe even scared about. So rather than get all PC about it and say people can't call me names and people can't do this and please government pass laws to stop people doing things that I don't like, I just thought, right, I'm going to learn to deal with people's reactions. So I went around wearing shorts when I first left the hospital just to see what reactions I'd get and see how I was with them. And uh, you got a range of reactions. My, one of my favorite ones was kids. Kids are great because kids are totally unselfconscious. And they'll just be like, oh my God, it's got one leg. How does it work? Is it behind it? Does it come off? Da -da -da. And so I'd end up just doing a, a workshop at the bus stop for a bunch of school kids very often. Uh, so that was great because it's all, it's all open and everyone's honest about it. Kids call you names as well, but you know, sticks and stones will break your bones and names will never hurt me. And, uh, and then you get what I call the sort of typical English person's reaction, the, probably the way I would have reacted in, 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 in that position, which would be, oh, curiosity. I mean, this isn't some sort of thing you see every day. People would be like, oh, I'd be looking like that. Oh, it's been one like that. And obviously, if I turned around and called them watching, they'd be like, oh. uh, So that was, that was an interesting one. Then there was another reaction that um, <laughs> I label in my uh, tiny poetic little mind as the Daily Mail reader's reaction. Uh, and this is a reaction that sometimes surprises people, but there are a number of people who see, see something like this and they're like, oh, uh, uh, and they grab the children and pull them away, as if to say, don't you know you're bringing the house prices down? <laughs> and um, obviously at first that's quite tough to take. It's quite difficult, but um, when I find myself asking the question, how could they do that? Um, I found it's quite useful to ask the question, what would make me do that? And when I asked that question, the answer I got was, um, most of us don't like to be reminded of the fragility and vulnerability of the human body. We're actually quite easily broken, and most people don't like to be reminded of that. And uh, so uh, it occurred to me that maybe, you know, if somebody is kind of afraid of that, me shoving my brokenness in their face uh, could easily scare them enough to turn in, you know, fear often turns into a sneer, right? Does that make sense to anyone? Yeah. yeah. Make sense to anyone? So fear can easily turn into a sneer. So rather than being, being offended by their reaction, uh, I learned to understand it as a fearful reaction and it didn't bother me anymore. That's nice, isn't it? Didn't need to get all PC and control the way they reacted. I just understood their reaction and it didn't bother me anymore. It's a good trick, Matt. Because we live in this culture of offence that really annoys me because the pe so many people have died for the right to free speech. But we live in, it seems that nowadays people think their right not to be offended is more important than the right to free speech. And you wouldn't think that if you lived in a country where you weren't allowed to speak freely. You would realise how precious free speech is and you wouldn't want to go around and be offended, offended, stop that, censor that, make them not be able to say that. Anyway, I'm on my soapbox now, I'll, I'll go yeah, Give us a poem. Good poem, yeah. So, um, <laughs> I want to tell you one more reaction though, because at, at the other end of the Daily Mail reader spectrum, uh, there was a, a reaction that I've probably got a dozen times in the last six years, and it always seems to come from a particular type of person. It's always a woman, and it's always something that in my tiny, poetic little mind, I label uh, handsome middle-aged women with children of university age. Oh dear. That's the, I get this reaction, and it's just a smile. Um, 
but it's not pity or anything like that. It's a smile that incorporates empathy and encouragement and solidarity and understanding and all every good adjective superlative you can think of. Uh, and the reason I, I recognize that particular smile from these handsome middle-aged women with children of university age is that for the rest of the day I'll literally be floating on or hopping on air. Uh, so, it, you know, it literally makes my day. So that's a nice reaction. And my final one I'll tell you about is um, it usually comes from either a, a Jamaican or an Irish guy outside of a pub, someone who looks like they've spent a lot of time inside and outside of pubs. And they'll see me walking along like this, and their eyes will light up. And, oh, come on, we're here, we're here. let me tell you what happened to me during the war. I've got a bit of shrapnel in my leg. Like that. And it will turn out that they're just so excited and happy to see someone that they think is worse off than them that I've immediately bought drinks and learned best friend. So that was a, that's a funny one. So yes, as I said, so this weird experience of going from all my life able-bodied and then bang, in a second, disabled. I uh, wanted to write a poem about the fact that, oh, I'm the disabled guy. It's not someone else, it's me. So it's called Disabled Guy. It's a terrible thing to lose a limb, but I've never bothered to ask why. Because what matters is learning to live with the fact that now I'm the disabled guy. I'm getting stared at by passers-by. Look, he's lost a leg. I think I'd rather die. I'm a freak. And people take a peek on the slum. I walk in a room and conversation runs dry. Sometimes fear becomes a sneer as I walk by. They can't hide their distaste no matter how hard they try. But some smile a smile that's wide and wry. Because they know it's all about the attitude I apply. Because on the inside, there's a tragic ladder I climb to kiss the sky. So most of the time, I feel like the most high, super fly, disabled guy. It's a hell of a thing becoming disabled after 40 able-bodied years. Hello, come in, sit down. Let me introduce you to your greatest fears. Here's a glass half full of laughter, and here's a glass half full of tears. And here's a brand new rude awakening to a completely new group of peers. So after 40 formative years, I stand before you deformed. The cause? The need for me to be reborn. The same cause all the fallen hordes hope not to be in forlorn. Shorn of my born adornment, I stand in the dark before the dawn, wearing the sexiest NHS accessory I've ever friggin' worn. I'm going to do a little bit of swearing here, so if anyone wants to put their... So when I get on the bus and I see some young fuck sitting in the disabled seats, the cheeky fuck, I say, check this bruv, and I slowly begin to pull my trouser leg up. And I stare at him, and I stare at the leg, and I stare at him, and I stare at the leg, and I stare at him, and I shake my head, and if looks could kill, well, he'd be dead. You see, I get my powers from the kids. Some call me a flit, but mostly come and spoke to gadget. And when they see the leg, they will point and stare. And when they see the stump, get scared. <laughs> well, my little mate Leo didn't care. He took one look and said, oh yeah, a bionic leg. Cool. I want one too. I'm like, wake up, Leo. Legs are best still attached to you. <laughs> See, I used to think we were freaks too. We used to make me uncomfortable, like we can do you. I didn't know what to say or do. I don't want to get caught up in any boo-hoo-hoo. But now I'm one of them, and they're one of me. Or when the shoe's on the other foot, it's amazing what you see. People dealing with agony and tragedy, with fantastic existential majesty. People whose physicality and neurology is way more damaged than me. But whose intensity of empathy is absolutely exemplary. You see, disabled people tend to be very experienced existentially. And our experience of reality is very valuable when it's used creatively and inspirationally. The very thing that you'd hate to be may be the key to your greatest destiny. It may be the perfect test to see if you can be more than you were born and blessed to be. Blessed be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so um, on the um, existential stand-up be poet, Theme. I'll just carry on with that. Um, uh, one of the um, most important realizations of um, existential, by the way, for those of you who don't know, it's just uh, um, uh, what it means to be, what it means to be human, what it is to be alive, 
that's what I'm interested in. And um, as far as human beings are concerned, uh, existentially it's true that we only have one freedom. There's only one true freedom. There's only one thing that can never be taken away from you under any circumstances, including the worst thing you could imagine. Prison, torture, concentration camp. And it is based on uh, a guy called Viktor Frankl, who wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. Anybody read that book? Know about Viktor Frankl? One of my heroes, um, uh, he was a Jewish psychiatrist that was in a concentration camp and he observed what happened to human beings in the concentration camp. And he noticed that even in that situation, that horrible, nightmarish, meaningless situation, some people were able to uh, not react in the way that we'd all imagine we'd react, which would be with fear and horror and terror and, and sort of, you know, absolute, you know, I can't take this. Some people actually chose to do things like put on cabaret shows in the concentration camp. If anyone's seen that film, Life is Beautiful, um, some people actually acted like the dad did in that. And some people went around giving food to people and being nurse to people and counsellor to people. Some people, even in the concentration camp, all they did was love and give. And what they showed was is that human beings have something called the human spirit, which is the most powerful force in the universe. And that one true freedom that we all have is to choose how we respond to the events of our lives. We can't control what happens to us, but whatever happens to us, you have the freedom to choose how to respond. And uh, uh, I wanted to write a poem, sort of in honor of all the people throughout history that have done that, millions and millions of people, your granny might have done it, your uncle, it's not only the famous people, it's not only the Nelson Mandela's and the Gandhi's and the Helen Keller's and people like that, uh, there's loads of people doing it and I call them attitude kings. Because that's, that's our one true freedom, our attitude. You can choose your attitude to life. And uh, that, this is the poem. So the world's divided into two types of people. I'm not talking about who I think's good and who I think's evil. I'm talking about the people who disbelieve the unbelievable. I'm talking about the achievers who achieve the unachievable. These are the people who seek to perceive the imperceivable, to dream the unfeasible and seize the keys to the unreachable. Somehow, they're able to make the meaningless meaningful, to appease the unappeasable and redeem the irredeemable. And when they make mistakes, they make sure they're only venial. They do what needs to be done, even if it is completely menial. They're utterly dynamic, yet remain serenely peaceable. They never seem to panic. Seems like they've already seen it all. In a sense, they can seem extremely unreasonable. For them, no disease is untreatable. Their attitude's unbeatable. It's inconceivable. Their inspiration isn't streamable. So I wrote this for it to be shared right here between us all. And then there's the other 99.9% .9 of humanity. Lost in vanity, insanity, and Bible Belt Christianity. Ecological destruction, materialist induction, and numerous forms of hyper-violent tribal eruption. Transport disruptions, shopping mall construction, credit crunch hunger, and public service reductions. Billions live in poverty with no political suction. You often live more meaningful lives than half the population of London. Where narcissism has now reached epic proportions. What's next? A reality show called My First Abortion. Caution. You are now a product of corporate extortion. Viewing mass media distortion as totally awesome. While acute social torsion causes more and more sons and daughters to be forced into dark and falsely awkward corners and given no quarter, they're reborn as fallen street mourners, leaving parents who are no more than poor, soul-broken mortals. Yeah, the world's in a mess. Tell us something we don't know. Yeah, the human race looks like it's going the way of the dodo. What can I do, though? Or Napoleon Solo? Well, you can stop blowing your own oboe and get to work in your attitude dojo. <laughs> no? You don't think so? You want to go on a go slow? I'm young, I want to have fun, I want to get jiggy like a bonobo. <laughs> yeah, I should coco. But if you don't want to be a no-show, all life asks if you give it 100% of your own flow. So it's not about what you do, it's about the way that you do it. It's not about what happens, it's about how you respond to it. So when life bites, don't swallow the meaning until you chew it. Because come judgment day, you either loved it or you blew it. You see, nothing really matters is the song life sings. So when death comes to call, <laughs> you won't give a toss about your bling. What the world needs is the inspiration only you can bring. So be your own inspiration. Be an attitude king.
Yeah, I'm do this one. It's a long one, so I've only got one more. It's a long one. Um, um, so somebody wants to ask Gandhi. You've got another five minutes. Yeah. Okay. So you can do two if you like. Okay, I'll do one. Um, someone wants to ask Gandhi what he thought. Oh, hold on. No, I'm going to do a different one actually. Yeah, no, that's too serious. I'll have a bit of fun. Do you have a bit of fun? Yeah. Do you want to do some audience participation? Yeah. Yeah, great, okay. Um, so, I consider myself a member of the counterculture and have for the last 10 years. And by that, I simply mean that um, I find the mainstream culture's uh, ruling idea that profits are more important than people and planet to be insane. And, um, and uh, I have lots of many friends who also would consider themselves in the counterculture. Obviously, a lot of people here uh, believe exactly the same thing. Uh, and uh, when I look at all of these amazing, passionate, talented, creative, hardworking people who are working to try and protect people and the planet, and uh, I, I noticed that uh, you know since the 60s, when we first discovered how much damage we were doing to the planet, um, in the last 40 years of activism, all of the issues that we've been facing, whether it's the rainforest, the topsoil, the oceans, pollution, waste, have all got way worse, even though so many activists have been working against it. And when I ask myself, well, how come uh, the counterculture hasn't had a, a greater impact on the mainstream culture? Um, you know, I like to think of it as a train. You know, the mainstream culture is on a train heading towards uh, what you might call the cliff of species extinction. And uh, the job of the counterculture is to help that, to switch signals, in fact, to change tracks uh, and, and, and take us towards the lush, verdant valleys of evolution. And uh, I, when I ask the question, how come we haven't done that? Um, the answer I get is um, something that my mum used to say, which I never really understood as a kid, but I think I do now, which is um, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And uh, when I look at my own life um, and the changes I, I try to make in my own life, whether it's giving up smoking, whether it's not watching as much Game of Thrones, whatever it might be, um, I notice that I have these good intentions, but somehow um, I still keep falling back into my own bad habits. But somehow I manage to self-sabotage. Sometimes I have some issues and wounds and shadows and stuff that gets in the way. And I thought, well, maybe that's what's happening with the counterculture. Maybe the counterculture has got wounds and shadows and stuff that's getting in the way and undermining its efforts. So, um, so I wanted to write a poem about that, which is um, a call to arms for all my countercultural buddies and also a good excuse to take the piss out of me and all my mates. And it's called uh, Tribesters because uh, those in the uh, counterculture often see themselves in different tribes. You know, you might be an activist or an anarchist or a spiritual devotee or a pagan or whatever. So there's all these different tribes. So I called it Tribesters. And when I wrote it, I had this kind of idea of a garage station playing kind of drum and bass and garage music. So in my head, it's to a garage beat. So the, the, the bit of audience participation, there's a, there's a melody. And uh, when you hear the, the, each line to this melody, what I'd like you to do is, is, to, is it's like you're giving a garage shout out. You know, it's like, yeah, big shout out to the man like Ron, big shout out to the man like Jack, that's you're kind of doing that. Um, but what you're, I'm actually going to ask you to say is, we got thee, we got thee. Uh, and for those of you who don't speak black, that means <laughs> we've got thee. We got thee, we've got thee, yeah? And so the melody goes like this. Sorry. We got the. We got the. We got the. God, that was so good. Nailed it. Okay, so yeah, so you can do one or two things. You can do it like at the at the end of each line of the chorus. Uh, if you want to, you can carry on during the verses, but what I've realized is that halfway through, people stop doing it. So, you know, just do it in the, in the chorus if you like. I know. We're just going to go on. We'll we got the. We got the, exactly, yeah. We got the. So, um, we'll start, I'll start off with the chorus. It'll be obvious that it's the chorus. And there's a little bit at the end of the chorus that you can join, into as well, join in with as well. So here it is, Tribesters. And actually, we'll start off with the melody and we'll get into it, yeah? We got 
of his new age hippies, supernatural pagans and spiritual devotees, conscious evolvers, healers and yogis, psychedelic shaman and indigenous wannabes, the tribesters are calling, they're calling your name, pick up the counterculture and put Babylon to shame, the tribesters are calling, they're calling your name, to pick up the counterculture and put Babylon to shame. Cook food is poison and raw is non-toxic. So why are so many raw fooders borderline psychotic? Activists campaigning and shaming Babylon. Giving their heart and soul to fight for right over wrong. Projecting their pain and abandonment issues. Sustaining the status quo in a zero-sum lose-lose. Pagan earth angels worshipping Gaia and the green man. We got it. Cursing technology while living in a transit van. We got it. The new age is thought craze is a completely new paradigm. We got it. Creating your own reality with nothing but the power of your mind. We got it. Your heart's in the right place and a genuine love of mankind. We got but it. an egotistical, oversimplistical, blind leading the blind. We got it. fooders, anarchy activists, new age hippies. Supernatural pagans and spiritual devotees. Conscious evolvers, healers and yogis. Psychedelic shaman and indigenous wannabes. The tribesters are calling, they're calling your name. To pick up the counterculture and put Babylon to shame. You can join in. The tribesters are calling, they're calling your name. To pick up the counterculture and put Babylon to shame. Spiritual, transcendental, I'm so non-attached But you're still clinging to your beliefs, mate So don't give me that crap Meditating, contemplating, resting in the witness But still acting like a junkie That's desperate for a fix of his bliss I'm so fucking conscious, so multidimensionally evolved Sitting on my high horse, all of my lower chakra problems have been solved Self-important asshole, dabbling in the dark side Giving orgasms to his harem, while his bank account starts to rise I'm a healer, I'm a feeler, I'm a reiki-wakey master but I've got no charm for a broken arm Cos I'm no mere plaster caster I'm an Ashtanga, Yogananda, Iyengar maestro My Kundalini is rising But my pain what is out of control Raw fooders, anarchy activists, new age hippies Supernatural pagans and spiritual devotees Conscious evolvers, healers and yogis Psychedelic shaman and indigenous wannabes The tribesters are calling, they're calling your name To pick up the counterculture and put Babylon to shame Can't you hear the tribesters are calling, they're calling your name To pick up the counterculture and put Babylon to shame Psychonauts and trippy chicks want to open up the legs of our minds Travelling to universes way beyond everyday space and time but instead of using these pointers to accelerate and integrate growth It's a solipsistic, self-infatuated, neurochemical joke I want to be a Hopi or honorary Cherokee chief but I'm conveniently ignoring their misogynistic beliefs I'm drinking ayahuasca, I'm a Mayan calendar rainbow kin Abstracting fantastic realities, cos I can't do the real thing My brothers, my sisters, me familia, me amigos Might we be taking ourselves a tattoo serious? Our beliefs are just stories we tell ourselves just to cope We've got to send them up not to get hung up on our very own rope dope now guess who's the biggest culprit when it comes to disappearing up their ass? I used to think I was enlightened when I lived under a tree inside a park. We've got to face the here and now reality without the crutch of belief. If we want to create a new world before Babylon's obsolete. Need a beginner's mind that's been refined and an unconditional heartbeat. If we want to create a new world before Babylon's obsolete. Boom. <laughs> Chris Paradox, ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause, please.
Um, Chris, where can people find you if they want to find out more? Because lots of people have been asking, who is that guy? Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, Chris Paradox, you can find me online, um, do loads of things online at Chris Paradox, and uh, uh, chrisparadox.com, in fact.